Hello and welcome to the Gold Goats and Guns podcast. This is episode 43 for today. What the hell? It's July 21st, 2020. My name is Tom Luongo and we have a lot to talk about. And today, I, I know it's going to be a, a, a barn burner because I finally have Whitney Webb, uh, investigative journalist and all around great person. And we're going to chat about all manner of things. I know that she's been hitting the uh, Ghislaine Maxwell story very hard. I also want to talk to Whitney about what's happening with monitoring our activity and disinformation and the way that you know things are being memory holed around the internet because i know it's an important topic for her and so whitney uh is now writing both for the last american vagabond as well as her own site over at unlimited hangout and she has a patreon where she has exclusive content so you know as as always check out everything that she's doing so good morning whitney how are you and how are things going well i'm doing well all things considered hopefully you're doing well as well I, you know, as best as possible in an age of the Orwellian panopticon, sir. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it truly really is that. To preface it with that, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, let's have an, hey, let's have an un, uh, unlimited conversation about whatever it is we want. Just understand that you're going to be monitored at every level that you're at. Like, you're not paranoid if you're right. And that's the scary part about all of it at this point. It's right. really, really weird. So, um, I read your latest article. Uh, from yesterday that you posted over at Unlimited Hangout uh, about the uh, the killing, uh, the, the attempted hit on the judge who's sitting on the Deutsche Bank, uh, Jeffrey Epstein case. A little professional jealousy here to see you push out something that detailed and that, um, uh, that well-researched uh, in that amount of time is actually really quite impressive uh, from my perspective. Like, wow, that's really nicely, ni- great work. And, and I read it last night before I went to bed and I was like, wow. That's a lot to think about. Now, I haven't had a chance to really dig into it and and uh, and have a lot to, to 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 say intelligently about it. But why don't you go over that and what you've been talking about with um with what you've uncovered relative to Jelaine Maxwell, and uh, we'll just go from there and we'll see where the conversation takes us. Uh, sure. Okay. So basically, the article. Um, I mean, there were a lot of different avenues I could have pursued also because I was <laughs> focusing on the previous employer of um, this guy who um, is alleged to have been the shooter uh, that killed um, Esther Salas's uh, son and shot her husband, whose name is Roy Den Hollander. He, um, of the official narrative that's been spun, right, is that, oh, he's an angry man's right activist and he doesn't like feminists. And so he targeted this judge who was the first Hispanic woman to hold this particular uh, you know, position in the judicial system in that particular area, which is, um, you know, frankly, I honestly, considering the case that she was just assigned to four days prior to the shooting, um, and also the fact that if that narrative is the case, why would he shoot the two men in the house and not the woman, you know, among other things? Um, It just seems quite odd, as is the fact that he was, you know, immediately discovered uh, dead before he could be questioned or arrested. Um, You know, the high profile nature of any case related to the Epstein scandal, which, of course, is a meta scandal for numerous other things. Mm -hmm. Um, But anyway, the article, I focus on how he previously worked for uh, a company Mm -hmm. that's been around for decades, but is is pretty notorious um, for those of us that research deep politics or whatever you want to call that field, (laughs) I guess, um, called Kroll. Kroll Associates, Kroll Inc. I mean, a lot of people refer to it as different ways. And of course, there's been numerous spinoffs of Kroll um, really since 2008, more or less. Um, Now they mostly operate through another uh, company that's basically very similar to the original Kroll called K2 Intelligence, meaning like two Kroll. It was founded by uh, the original Kroll, Jules Kroll and his son, Jeremy. Um, Basically, Kroll Associates um, has for decades been known, at least since the 1980s, as either the CIA of Wall Street or private CIA. Um, This is because it it was really like the first private intelligence firm and ended up inspiring uh, subsequent, um, you know, uh, companies of that nature, including Black Cube, among others, which originally aspired to be Israel's Kroll. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Kroll uh, has a penchant for hiring former CIA, FBI officials, also former, uh, you know, big name police commissioners from NYPD, LAPD. They also hire extensively from Mossad and uh, Britain's MI6. So they're basically full of all these ex spooks. They do nominally corporate intelligence. They've done um, they do uh, security for executives, bodyguards. 
um, things like that. Um, of course, they also got into the mercenary business with the Iraq War, um, working with Blackwater and DynCorp, uh, serving the US, USA uh, CIA front um, and other groups like that connected to the U.S. government and to U.S. intelligence in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, they have a pretty interesting history. Um, they've also been accused by other intelligence agencies, including uh, French intelligence, of being a uh, legitimate front themselves for the CIA. Right. So they're definitely right. very intelligence up. What's interesting about this Den Hollander guy is that he was working um, at their Moscow office in the late 90s. Um, Kroll first really got established there during the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, they were involved in the, some of the privatization efforts um, of the Boris Yeltsin era, which, of course, was a you know corrupt free for all. Um, mm -hmm. And then also this guy was working there when there were. Um, Working for Kroll when there was this issue of the the separatists in Chechnya, um, a lot of the kidnappings and bombings uh, at the time that were alleged to also have ties to Al Qaeda, of course, people that li are listening to your podcast. I think the last time I was on, we actually talked about the Taliban and Al Qaeda mm -hmm. uh, to an extent, right? And how, yes, we did. you know, those, you know, the, the CIA ties of all of that, right? So it's definitely interesting uh, to see those connections. Of course, he's also um, this guy. Din Hollander allegedly got tied up with some sort of Russian mafia thing uh, during that period of time. It's worth pointing out that uh, organized crime in the in Russia, also the U.S. and um, Israel, which is part of the story too. Often, you know, I mean, the the line between organized crime and their intelligence agencies, as it is for some other countries too, is you know honestly kind of paper thin. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of connections between those organized crime networks between countries particularly um, Russia and Israel, um, because a lot of, it, but also the U.S., and actually um, I wrote about this in um, my recent series on, on the Maxwell family, is that it was actually Robert Maxwell that helped facilitate a lot of those connections by getting, because he had a lot of ties to uh, the former Soviet Union um, and, and connecting uh, organized crime figures, getting them Israeli passports so they could enter the U.S. financial system, you know, among other things. So, they're, you know, it, it's really, um, you know, we're talking about all these different elements, intelligence agencies, organized crime and all of that. But the more you look at um, these types of networks and things like that, um, they, you know, the, the lines can be kind of, you know, um, murky, you know, it oh, all yeah. just sort of mixes together. Right. Oh, so anyway, it's very interesting that this, this character was working for, uh, Kroll associates, um, for, uh, because of, you know, um, their ties to these, these intelligence, um, and organized crime figures, which of course pop up extensively in the Epstein scandal itself. And of course, what we're seeing here with this Deutsche Bank case is that this is, um, a prodding, of Epstein's financial network, which I think much more than the uh, sexual blackmail network uh, scares the powerful uh, sure. that, you know, that that stand to lose from this. And I think a lot of people in looking at this case overlook that because there's been a tendency by media to report on the more salacious right. aspects of that scandal. Right. But I think a lot of it has to do with the financial crimes of Epstein, because let's remember, right, that this sexual blackmail operation, it began in 1991. Mm -hmm. uh, with Jeffrey Epstein and, and, and Ghislaine Maxwell, right? And then it continues by all appearances up until his first arrest in like 2007, roughly, right? So, but, you know, Epstein's career spanned much more than that time period. And so before the 90s, um, in the 70s and in the 1980s, he was working um, first for Bear Stearns on Wall Street. Um, he, he has to leave because of an SEC investigation and insider trading involving the Bronfman family. And then he gets yep. involved in this uh, shady financial world, which honestly overlaps a lot with Kroll and what in the services Kroll uh, claims to offer. But I mean, I, we, we don't know a lot about exactly who Epstein was working for, but basically what Epstein described himself as doing in that period was being a financial bounty hunter, which he said involved trying to track down and find money embezzled by by people on behalf of corporations and also governments. That's exactly uh, what Kroll Inc. has done uh, for decades. Right. Right. But also uh, Epstein said that he would also hide money for those same individuals, those same governments and those same corporations, depending. We know that some of his clients during the, that, those time, uh, that time were arms dealers like Adnan Khashoggi, who of course has ties to US intelligence, was also on the payroll for Israeli intelligence, obviously connected to Saudi intelligence as well. 
And then you have other like UK arms dealers that he was also very involved with during that period of time. So, you know, it's really not clear exactly what financial institutions he was connected to. It could have been BCCI. Um, it could have been he could have been doing, you know, some sort of freelance work for a group like Kroll that in the 1980s, they were really the pioneers of that type of uh, service, I guess you could say, to Wall Street. Right. Right. So, you know, um, what's so, you know, the fact that he was involved in those types of networks, um, you know, back then and that 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 involvement continued through the 90s during the sexual blackmail operation as well. And that after his first arrest. He continued a lot of the, those financial activities, um, I think, it is very threatening to a lot of people. Um, you know, there's people, very powerful people that stand to lose more from that than, you know, uh, who is in videos with Epstein and all of that. Let's remember, too, that the feds have had all of Epstein's blackmail for who knows how long. And, you know, they haven't really used it yet, at least not publicly, right? So, I mean, there's definitely... Uh, some things they wish to keep from coming out, in my opinion, a lot of that has to do with the financial networks uh, that yeah. Epstein maintained. It's worth pointing out, too, that with Deutsche Bank specifically, all other financial institutions dropped Epstein at the latest by 2013 or 2012, somewhere in that ballpark. But the only bank to not do so was Deutsche Bank, um, which he continued uh, to use, and they didn't close all of his accounts there right until they were preparing charges against him last year. So it was it was like two weeks before he was arrested. Um, right. Yeah, so Deutsche that's... Bank was there until the very yep. end. And they started allegedly to start shutting down his accounts because people that worked at Deutsche Bank were complaining about it at the yeah. end of 2018. But they did it in such a way that he had dozens of accounts there, right, that they didn't close them all at once. They would close one. And then the other one, you know, giving him time to move money around and out of the country and actually top executives, or top, sorry, not executives, but, you know, uh, the top people in the, you know, alleged anti money laundering compliance office of Deutsche Bank, right, had complained and flagged Epstein in 2015 and 2016 and pretty much every year up until his arrest and nothing was done. Right. So right. there's definitely some odd oddities. Um, going on there. Something I point on the article is that there's actually a lot of overlap between um, Kroll's credit rating agency and Deutsche Bank that a lot of um, Deutsche Bank executives and, and directors and vice presidents end up being employed by Kroll um, later on, which is, um, you know, um, interesting in and of itself, considering the invo uh, involvement of this, um, you know, alleged shooter. But I mean, we don't actually know if he was the shooter. I should point that out as well. Um, you know, this is very clearly, in my opinion, some sort of cover up that we're getting this this narrative that, oh, it's a man's right activist and he hates women. And that's why he did it when, you know, he's connected to someone like Kroll when this lady, um, this judge is overseeing, you know, a big time Epstein case. Because um, this Deutsche Bank case, by the way, I should point out um, the U.S. Well, the, really, the, the New York Department of Finance. Uh, tried to tie this up and make this case go away because they settled with Deutsche Bank for a hundred and fifty million dollar fine. Right. right. And that was supposed to be the end of it. But what happened is that investors in Deutsche Bank uh, filed a class action lawsuit against the bank because they didn't think that fine was sufficient. Right. So mm -hmm. the case doesn't go away and, it, and it's resurrected. And that and, and that is what, you know, Esther Salas uh, was assigned to oversee, uh, you know, about what, five or six days ago. Right. right. So what's, um, what's this is something. This, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. So what's interesting about this is, is what I'm hearing from all of this is, is, is there's a, 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 a kind of thread that runs through all of this in my mind. And that is that all this is taking place in the Southern District of New York. Right. Yes. It's all taking place, place under that rubric. And it's and at the same time as all of these things are happening, just Wayne Maxwell being arrested, um, Solace being uh, assigned the case, this new Deutsche Bank class action lawsuit. All of these things are all we're all under the 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 um, uh, the what's the what are, under the it, office it, of Jeffrey of Jeffrey Berman, the U.S. Right. attorney. And well, then, he was just fired, though. Right. Yeah, no, I'm going to that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, that's the thing is that Berman's been sitting on all of the Epstein. He's the guy who got all the Epstein information in the first place during the original raid in, in July of 2019 or June of 2019. Right. right. Last summer. He's been sitting on. He's also been sitting on on Anthony Weiner's laptop as well. And right. So the Southern District of New York exists to protect Wall Street and to protect intelligence services mm -hmm. 
that are connected to Wall Street. So obviously Kroll and, you know, um, and we can go back to Edmund Safra and Bill Browder. I, the entire time you're, you're, you're talking about this, the only name that keeps coming up in my head is, oh, you know, Browder's in the background here. You know that him and Christopher Steele and all those guys over at MI6, you know they're all involved in this. And they're all that, that at a certain level, all of this ties mm-hmm. into all of the other things that we know about what was done in Russia and later in Ukraine and other places. Right. Uh, to create, um, to, to destroy those societies and to extract all the wealth and allow Wall Street to walk in and steal it all. And this is why they hate Putin, because Putin, of course, stopped all that. So I'm just, I'm fascinated to listen to this. And I just want you to, like, the, to, put, to, the, to, put that, to, to put that bow on it, because the, the, the big question is, uh, right now is, What's going on with the Southern District of New York and why are – and this is, I think, where you and I may, may disagree. Is that why is Trump and or Barr pushing the Southern District of New York at this moment in time the way they are? Because it's very obvious that they made a, a power play for control of the Southern District of New York's U.S. Right. Attorney's Office and failed, right? Correct. So now mm-hmm. what? So what does that actually mean in the context of all the stuff that you just talked about, which is all absolutely fascinating? So – well, well, really quick, I wanted to touch on something you said about about Browder and Safra. Let's remember mm-hmm. Robert Maxwell, very deeply connected to Safra, also mm-hmm. was uh, Bill Browder is one of Maxwell's protégés. It's worth pointing out that Ghislaine um, was one of the few people, perhaps the only person, that knew about her father's shady financial networks after his death when he died on that yacht. The first person in his office was Ghislaine Maxwell. She was seen going around, shredding documents, taking documents. She knew exactly what was what, right? And then she goes Mm -hmm. to New York and this whole operation with Epstein begins. Epstein, of course, and and whatever Ghislaine was doing financially, intimately connected, also, of course, tied up with Leslie Wexner, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of those financial networks that Robert Maxwell, um, you know, created or, uh, you know, was connected to, Epstein and Ghislaine were also connected to. So it would make sense you know, that right. these types of individuals, you know, like Browder, among others, and that we're seeing the ties of this, this Kroll Associates alleged gunman, you know, to, you know, Russian organized crime to Kroll and all of this stuff. I mean, it like makes a lot of, it, it definitely is all connected. And so I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, but anyway, with regards to what's going on in SD and why, I mean, there's a lot of different competing theories. So initially, some people thought that, especially after Ghislaine Maxwell was arrested, that this was going to be, you know, this was about the Epstein case that Barr and Trump or whatever didn't want that arrest to happen. Um, I don't really agree with that. Um, And I was kind of skeptical uh, about that at the time, because the way that they have, quote unquote, investigated the Epstein scandal, I think is just a joke, honestly, and is is Mm -hmm. just, you know. Um, I, in my opinion, when Ghislaine Maxwell was arrested, I thought the charges were very lenient um, sure. because, you know, they admit in the indictment that she was involved in the sexual assault and, and essentially, you know, the rape of these young women. Right. Uh, they don't charge her for that. They charge her for enticing them to cross state lines of course. and, you know, and, and a couple counts of perjury. And they keep the time frame from 1994 to 1997. They keep the number of victims to three. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of other things that were going on in that time period, but they conveniently pick the time period where there's no involvement of Prince Andrew, Alan Dershowitz, or officially anyway, Bill Clinton, in order to keep those names um, sort of out of this orbit. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So definitely um, weird things going on. It's worth pointing out Jeffrey Berman by no means is a clean guy. He used to work for Rudy Giuliani, um, Mm -hmm. but he's definitely sort of been in this, um, you know, uh, mainstream, never Trumper side of things. So I think a lot of um, the reason, if I had to guess, right, obviously I'm just speculating about why this, why Barr uh, had him removed and, and this power play and all of that, that it sort of comes down to how Berman was attempting to investigate Trump's finances on behalf of, for political reasons because of, of his, uh, you know, um, I guess I don't want to say alliance, but, you know, he, that he was in that camp of the, the never Trumper establishment, never Trumpers sure. that are always talking about Trump's tax returns or Deutsche Bank. Right? right. So what's interesting is that the pick, the the uh, bar and in, in, I guess by extension, you could argue Trump's pick to replace Berman in the Southern District of New York used to represent Deutsche Bank specifically in one of their anti money laundering probes during the Obama administration. Mm-hmm which I think is interesting because, um, you know, uh, 
uh, even though Epstein, you know, in, in the arrest of Ghislaine, you know, followed Berman uh, leaving, we don't really know what the status of the Deutsche Bank stuff is. And now we have this happen uh, to this judge's family. Right. So it's definitely seems like there's um, some real dirt um, that could come out. Um, if Deutsche Bank is investigated either in connection with, you know, this Epstein case or in connection with Trump um, or Kushner, right, um, mm -hmm. or any of these people. And there's definitely seems to be um, that definitely seems to be concerning some very powerful individuals much more than, you know, who Epstein had tapes of. Right. No, I, I, I'll agree with that completely. And what's in, what I think is I still I, I still look at everything that's happening. I think it's very obvious that Berman was put in place. Uh, by Chuck Schumer and the New York State League, uh, Judiciary Board, because remember his appointment was was weird simply because the Senate wouldn't confirm any of Trump's picks after he fired Pre Paraha. So this is the second time that Trump has attempted to get control of this, the, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York and failed. And so Berman was put in mm -hmm. place. Obviously, no one is allowed to take over that office that is not uh, acceptable to quote unquote the powers that be. Call them the Davos crowd. Call them the bad guys. Call them whatever you want. Doesn't matter. <laughs> And, right. Well, and what's his, interesting and, and also. Even, and, 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 oh, sorry. And the last thing is, I was to say, is to remind that, that Audrey Strauss, who's now in that uh, that role, was brought out of retirement by Berman when he was appointed. So right. she's just as you have to assume that she's just as as dirty as the rest of them. And she's going to cover everything up. So my read of the of the original um, Maxwell indictment and the subsequent charges that they've added are all to focus on. To, to push her into in, 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 to push the indictment into that realm uh, and keep it there and whitewash everything else while what I think is actually happening is the exact opposite of that which is that that Trump and Barr are actually trying to blow this thing wide open they just don't have the tools to do it if you understand what I mean and so they keep pushing this and forcing people to make to to make um, React to, to react to the situation. So they pressure Berman. That doesn't work. They try to get rid of him. So next they bring Maxwell in and that forces a situation where they then put, you know, they, they keep the, the light indictment and then and they try and um, keep all of everything about Delay Maxwell in the Southern District of New York. And what I think is they may be setting up, and we'll see what happens over over time, is whether or not there's going to be other indictments brought that try to open up the treasure trove of information about what's actually, you know, get, get a hold of um, uh, Wiener's laptop, get a hold of the Epstein records and everything else. And I think they have to do that. In order to do that legally, they need to be able to come up with other other um, another case or another indictment. And I'm um, in, in, in some way. So I think that that's part of what's happening here because the 3,000 foot picture is that all of this is trying to get, is trying to stop Brexit and get rid of Donald Trump, which is my theory. Because it's obvious they're trying to get rid of Donald Trump. It's obvious they're trying to stop Brexit. With news this morning that the European Union just got their fiscal integration package through after five to, after triple overtime over at the summit, it's clear what the big plan is here, which is to transfer power from the United States and the UK other than that and it's a complete distraction as you pointed out well yeah i have a little uh, a little <laughs> different take in the sense that i don't I, think uh bill right. barr has any interest in blowing any of this wide open if anything they want a more access to the information acquired by what was previously the berman led sdny right that relates to both of these cases and if there are tidbits mm -hmm. in there that are politically expedient uh, to Trump and his reelection, for example, like the Wiener laptop, for example, sure. uh, to release and they will do so. But I do not think it's going to be some side, some sort of blow it all wide open and let it all come out. Bill Barr's entire career has been about covering stuff up. He was first um, first worked for the CIA um, in their legal uh, office of legal counsel, stonewalling mm -hmm. the church committee. Uh, which was trying to investigate CIA yep. abuses. And he was attorney general, um, you know, under Bush senior, where he, you know, pardoned uh, people involved in the Iran-Contra scandal. He also covered up the Inslaw affair, uh, the Promise Software scandal, which of course intimately involved um, Robert Maxwell and, you know, mm -hmm. people like Ed Meese, who, you know, is also an advisor to Trump and has been since his since he was elected right so and then you have bill barr become you know he has ties to the defense team of epstein during the sweetheart deal um working at the same law firm as them kirkland and ellis you know mm -hmm. so he's definitely not 
um, one of those guys that has a has a history of you know putting it all out in the open. It's it's actually quite the opposite. But, but I here's do the not, question. Here's uh, the question. Mm-hmm. Here's the question. Ready? Why does Barkin out of retirement to save Trump? Because he did. He came. This is the. This is why I keep coming back to this stuff. Barr came out of retirement to save Trump by issuing the opinion and then making it. Once he became attorney general, making it the official interpretation of the Department of Justice, the standard for obstruction of justice, which stopped the Mueller investigation and destroyed, effectively destroyed Andrew Wiseman's career. Okay, this is this this is a big moment that that Barr comes out of retirement. Okay. And 90 percent of what I think Bill Barr has covered up over his his time has been to be the Bush family consigliere and to cover up the crimes of the Bush family. Was the Bush family was the dominant um, was dominant in U.S. intelligence all through the 80s and right. 90s. When, when, and so I, I, I buy all that and I buy that not all of this stuff is going to come out. Like I ex- fully expect all of this to come out whitewashed of all of Papa Bush's crimes and all sure. of a certain number of people's crimes, but I'm not talking about blowing everything open here. I'm talking specifically about the people that Trump and Barr want to go after, which are, I think, the real traitors to the United States, and that's the Obama administration, who are actively it's trying to, under, to undermine the United States government right here, right now, activating Antifa in the streets and all of that. I don't don't get lost in the in the past because these men are now living here in the future. Why does Donald Trump put himself on the line the way he has? He didn't have to do any of this, right? He did, and he's made this abundantly clear. He didn't have to become president to whitewash himself of his crimes. Right. right? Well, so, I, I think part of this too, though, with the Russia investigation, has to do with the fact of of the networks we were just talking about a little earlier, right? The real RussiaGate, quote unquote, scandal, any sort of thing that's even remotely interesting in there, has to do with these these money flows between Russian right. organized crime, Israeli organized crime and U S organized crime. And then, you know, their respective ties to intelligence. Mm-hmm. Um, there are things there that do not uh, behoove Trump to be made public, right? They sure. don't benefit him at all. They also don't benefit people that are, you know, tied up with bill Barr. Um, sure. As far as, you know, who are traitors to America though, I think also, you know, bill Barr fits in there as does the I Bush agree. family. Um, maybe that's not, um, you know, it, in terms of like what, you know, we're looking at, you know, if you're talking about like the civil unrest and things like that, you know, there may be one, uh, another faction involved in there. But we have to remember, too, that like these, you know, these political dynasties, they're essentially factions of you know, mm-hmm. different crime families, Absolutely. right, that are vying Absolutely. for control. You look at the Clintons, for example. I mean, they have ties going back to Iran-Contra, which was, you know, a Papa Bush thing. Yes. Right. So, um, you know, it's definitely murky. It's not, it's not, you know, a black and white thing, but I mean, I think this, so, you know, if, if, and when, uh, you know, information comes out of these, um, various cases or investigations at SDNY that benefit Barr and Trump, I mean, they will be very cherry picked, um, as is anything that comes out that damages Barr and Trump, right? Of course. So... It's, it's all important. I, I think it's really important to have, you know, some perspectives um, on that. But I mean, as far as what they could have that, you know, that would come out to damage the Obama administration or, or Biden and things like that, I honestly think they would be probably their their most superficial crimes, if anything, because when you get into the deeper uh, criminal activity, it, you know, the whole bipartisan thing uh, <laughs> comes out, yeah. right, that, that both parties are fundamentally you know, criminal and corrupt. Right. So, I mean, we'll see what happens, but we also have to keep in mind, right. It's an election year. And I think they either side will attempt to have certain tidbits come out in order to play into, you know, uh, that aspect of what's going on. But those things are, you know, for the public, it's political theater. It's not really about the deeper facts of, and and realities of what are going on right now. Uh, Yeah. We're never, we're never going to get the truth of any of this stuff. I'm don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying, Oh, Trump and Barr are the good guys. And these guys are the bad guys. No, they're all terrible, right? They're all gangsters as you, you call them all. Yes. I call (laughs) call Trump. Trump runs the United States like a gangster. He was trained by Roy Cohn. He's trained by one of the best. He runs the country this way. His foreign policy is very gangster. Like I, I have, I have huge, I have huge, uh, uh, problems with the way he um, handles foreign policy, and I think that's you fight dragons. And sometimes, unfortunately, this is the this is where this is where I agree with with certain critics of 
uh, of libertarians, right? And you and I are both libertarians, which is that we want to sit, uh, we want, we always want to analyze the world and, you know, from, you know, the, this is wrong perspective, right? This is morally wrong. Yes. But, and sometimes to fight dragons, you need to hire a dragon because that's the only way we're going to get through this because the people that you're fighting against are so powerful or so corrupt that unfortunately, yeah, the way and means by which you fight this or, or, or you pick your champion to fight this battle for you is do you use somebody like that? And I think Bill Barr is a perfect I, I think there's a I think there's something here between Trump and Barr seeing the bigger problem now, which is that it was one thing when all this stuff was going on back in the seventies, the eighties and the nineties, and even into the early aughts. Yeah, were was was Barr a a, 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 a a foundational member of the deep state building all of these terrible crimes? Of course. But now all of that infrastructure that's that he helped build is now being turned and used into something I think quite against what he built it for in the first place or people like him built it for in the first place. And because you, because the bigger picture here is again, I keep going back to what is very obvious in the, in what's happening around the world right now, which is that there's a massive push right now to transfer power from the United States to Europe. It's been this push towards a transnational oligarchy that's built on technocratic grounds. It's one of the things I, I, I want to trans, trans, uh, transition this conversation into, which is to talk about the growing panopticon, the use of now unbelievable use of medical, uh, the, the medical infrastructure to then become the new, to bypass civilian government and become yeah, effectively it's the medical, other. medical martial law is, yeah, is medical martial is law going. Law intents and purposes because they can't get past the constitution because they can't get past certain aspects of our legal system. And so now they're just going to, we're going to go, we're going to, we're going to trump up everybody into, into, in, in, in fear porn and then just, and then set people against each other because the last thing they ever want to have happen is for the, 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 everybody who's getting screwed. That means you, me and everybody else on all sides of the political spectrum. The one thing they never want us to do is all look at, look around at each other and go, yeah, are you getting screwed? I'm getting screwed. And it's them doing it. Right. And that's what this is now about. And now we've got this we've got this we've got a society here in the United States breaking down like the good guys wear masks and the bad guys don't. And, you know, <laughs> right. And, no, seriously, that's the, oh, I, I know. I know that well, there, there was it's an crazy. article in, in Yahoo News, I think a day or two ago about this guy wrote and it said it's OK to yell at, at non mask wearers or yes. something like that. And he was saying something like. You know, people that don't wear masks are flouting a new societal norm, yep. which is what he called it. And he said, thinking that they have the right to breathe freely and freely was in quotes. And I was just reading that like, oh, my goodness. Yeah, no, no. Now breathing. Well, they've already weaponized CO2. They've already weaponized that you um, that you breathe out, you know, the, the world's big, the world's most dangerous poison. Carbon dioxide. <laughs> Right. I mean, yeah, which which trees require to exist, know, you know, because trees know. do they, the opposite, cause, you know, science. Cause, cause they no hate one cares. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that they hate Canadian people. That's what it comes to. Look, green people just hate Canadians because they don't want they don't want them growing wheat and being economically successful growing wheat up in Canada. So they want the they, they want, you know, CO2 concentrations to stay low. They want to starve the trees and kill Canadians. That's the way I put it anymore. It's just, it's <laughs> really? just, just to make it completely <laughs> ridiculous. They just want to kill all the Canadians. All right. Well, so. yeah. <laughs> I'm being facetious, of course, but no, you know. I know, I know. It's just, you know, I mean, I could, ima I, I could, you know, <laughs> given how insane things are today, I could actually like imagine that being in an article and someone putting that out, acting like they're serious and people believing it. Sure. Like, I mean, <laughs> the Babylon, how Bee, the Babylon are. Bee should write that, should write that headline. No, uh, global, <laughs> global warming activists revealed that just truly hate Canadians. Like I can write the, I can write the satire now. The problem is they're only five minutes ahead of the news. And right. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's true. So, um, so, so let's talk about that, that stuff. Cause I, I mean, while I follow it at the cultural level, I follow it at the kind of metaphoric and what, it, what this means level. I don't follow it at the guts level about what's happening with the, with, uh, uh, with Google and Facebook and, and all of this stuff. I am aware of it. I know they're going to, I know they're going to, they're going to silence me at some point. It is what it is. Um, I'll do what I have to do to, to maintain my, my lifestyle and I'll either succeed or fail at doing that. Um, but, 
talk to me. What have you seen recently from these people? Because I know that they're stepping up the control and it's obvious that it's a lot of it is an election year strategy. Um, but at the same time, I think it's also laying the groundwork for something very, very ugly. So, um, oh, absolutely. So go go thou forth and let's let's talk about something. <laughs> let's talk about well, something even less fun than Jillian Maxwell. Sure, sure. Well, first of all, I am highly skeptical that there will even actually be an election this year. Um, I think even if there is one, um, that it will immediately devolve into much worse uh, unrest and general chaos, I guess you could say, than there is now with uh, neither side buying the outcome, regardless of what it is. And they've already, I mean, they set up this narrative last year, um, U.S. intelligence, uh, the Department of Justice, DHS, I'll put out a joint statement basically saying this would be the case. It was in mainstream media last year. I mean, the narrative has been seeded for well over a year now. Um, they're going to blame, of course, foreign interference, um, whether it's China, it's Russia, or it's Iran. Um, they've set up all of that. They've also set up the narrative that there's going to be major hacks um, mm -hmm. in and around Election Day involving the power grid. Um, involving other things. Um, of course, a lot of the people making those claims um, are U.S. or Israeli intelligence um, uh, people that work for those agencies or people that used to work for those agencies that now run private cybersecurity companies, right, right among other ones. Um, so I definitely think there's going to be um, in a huge increase in chaos the closer we get to that. Um, you were talking about um, techno technocratic overlord, you know, factions, right, um, at the EU. But I would argue that the factions that we're seeing fight out in a big way, at least in the U.S. right now, you know, uh, the globalist one, I guess you could say, but also the one that backs Trump, um, right? They both are interested in creating technocratic sure. AI driven panopticons, but for different reasons. So you, you see different uh, factions pushing for that. Um, but um, I actually think to a large extent they overlap. And what there really is is that there's a disagreement over strategy. Um, I say this because a couple months ago I wrote about this National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence that is essentially driving um, how the Pentagon and also how uh, U.S. intelligence uh, utilize uh, artificial intelligence and uh, there in that commission unites uh, U.S. intelligence, uh, the DOD, but also Silicon Valley mm -hmm. um, are all represented on there as sort of this nexus. And essentially the line between the three of those is very blurred. A lot of the Silicon Valley giants of today were originally funded by the CIA via NQTEL. Yes, they um, or they get um, funding from DARPA or their contractors to the U.S. military now. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, it's definitely essentially the same blob. Right. So anyway, this this National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, they had this uh, document that came out through a Freedom of Information Act request that very few people reported on. Um, but I wrote I mean, my report was essentially about that. And um, within that report. Oh, <clears throat> sorry. Um, and and within that report, um, it, it talks about these different strategies. Right. Um, and one of them is. Do we leapfrog China in, in the sense that we try and get ahead of China in the AI game? And the way to do that is to force the adoption and implementation of AI driven technologies and these surveillance technologies to an extent far beyond what China is currently doing. Or do we work with Chinese China's economic elite and their power structure um, and do it together? Right. Mm. So I think there's a disagreement over. Um, which one is chosen. Um, of course, what's interesting is that the head of this National Security Commission on AI is Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, very right. uh, big backer of the Clintons, also very close to Henry Kissinger. If you know anything about Henry Kissinger and his views on China, it's pretty easy to, to know which of those strategies someone like right. Kissinger will favor, right? But let's remember too that Kissinger also has uh, met with Trump and advised Trump on, on several occasions. Um, you know, it, we don't really know. I mean, th there's definitely the posturing of the Trump camp, right, about like, oh, we have to get rid of Huawei and 5G um, and we have to ban TikTok and, and all of this stuff, right? But um, it's really hard to know which strategy they favor behind the scenes because essentially at the end of the day, it's about money and it's about control, right? So what is... Um, you know, if, if the possibility of leapfrogging, as they call it in this document, of leapfrogging China is impossible and means the U.S. would lose, 
and lose out on that money and that control, you know, mm -hmm. which one will they ultimately choose? They may posture publicly a certain way, but behind closed doors, it may be something different because the main concern of this, of this grouping, right. Uh, that this national security commission, um, represents their, their main concern is that if they don't either ally with China or leapfrog China, you know, uh, they'll be to the U S will totally be left behind and China will obtain hegemony because they'll, basically set the market standard and become the global leader of AI if the U.S. Right. doesn't get in the game somehow, right? right? So what they care about is that long term. And so whichever strategy is most likely to net them that is what they will do. Yeah, no, that, that, that seems reasonable. Uh, uh, and by the way the Trump administration is acting and the level and um, intensity of the arm twisting over Huawei that has been uh, in play, it, to me, it looks very much like uh, they're going to have to we're going to have to play ball as opposed to leapfrog. I know what he's trying to do is slow my way down so they get a chance to leapfrog. That's what it sounds like. Um, but I don't think that's going to work. Um, but again, all of these things. And, and if you look at again, if you look at what's happening geopolitically, it's very obvious that the UK becomes the focal point of which way everybody's going to jump. The EU is happy to use Huawei and Angela Merkel's telling Trump to go pound sand. And, and, but at right. but Boris Johnson uh, finally caved to Trump because Johnson's future as, pre, as prime minister of, of the UK depends on Trump's reelection. Okay. Because if John, if Trump loses Everything about the Brexit trade deal and Britain's future autonomy ends because Joe Biden, the first thing he does after he wins is he, he takes the trade deal off the table with with the UK. And then Johnson has to fold on a trade deal and they wind up with something worse than staying in the European Union. They're now out of the European Union. Now the goal is to get them out, but put them but have to give them no voice, but bind them down with all the rules. OK, right. That's mm -hmm. that's been the strategy. And I'm telling you that when you look at what these guys are doing, what they're building in Europe is a uh, is an unelected technocracy that just dictates mm -hmm. and then sets the standard for everybody else. I keep using the EU as like, look, they're like California. Every bad idea that's ever ever come out of the United States started in California and then migrated east. Why? California is the largest economy in the United States and therefore everybody else has to comport to their standards. So if the so if emissions on cars, if they say we want lower emissions on cars, well, then all the cars in the United States are built to that lower emission standard because selling cars in California is more important than selling cars in Iowa. Just that simple. Well, guess what? Same thing with the European Union. This is why no one's going to be allowed to leave. This is why they're doing everything that they're doing. And this is why the United States is right now under attack culturally, politically, and economically by people who are both by, 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 by foreign, by actors, both foreign and domestic who have our, who do not have our best interests at heart. It's very clear to me that that's where we're in. That's where we're in. At the same time, everybody's trying to build those same people are trying to build an Orwellian panopticon that trend and the legal infrastructure to bypass national governments through transnational trade deals and, and the Paris Accords and all this other stuff that obviate and do away with the need for any kind of legal recourse because international courts or international arbitration is what will is what'll take place and you will have no rights and your the laws that are made locally won't have any have any sticking power. We're seeing that already in the European Union. Right. And that model is to be translated around is to be overlaid around the entire West with the United States, with the husk of whatever's left of the United States economy being transferred to Europe. And that's what's happening. And then everything we're seeing today politically is feeding that. And all of these other things are are, you know, this is a very important point. And and I I absolutely um, buy into that. We're trying to figure out who's going to control the panopticon. But oh right, mm -hmm. yeah. But the the but the, the, the bigger issue is that look, China's already built it. I mean, they already have it. Now the question is whether or not it's, that any of these systems are going to last, right? And and you know, these systems are still fundamentally metastable because no one wants to live like. And when the more you place people under that kind of stress, the weirder their behavior, and the more aberrant their behavior. 
and the more mm-hmm. violent their behavior. And that's what we're seeing social unrest all around the West. I mean, no one's talking about I haven't seen it other than a couple of places that there's massive civil unrest happening in Israel right now over COVID-19. That's true. Calls mm-hmm. calls for Netanyahu, of all people, to stand down, resign and stand trial like he's having to deal with that. No one's talking about this. That's not we don't find that. We don't see that in the news anymore. So uh, this is all this, this stuff. Is, this is just fascinating. And um, and it's no I, I don't I'm not surprised at all to hear that Eric Schmidt is heading up all this stuff. Right. Of course he is. Google and Microsoft and all these companies were chosen. And this ties right back into Epstein. Why do you think these people were chosen? Because they've got them. They've got them. They've got them on tape. The blackmail. They've got they know what their what their weird proclivities are or corrupt their proclivities, their proclivities in order to get them to the point where they're willing to do what, you know, in order to play that game. It's a very, very weird. But it all ties together. And I don't sound like I mean, I sound like a conspiracy theorist, but it, it, you can see it when I, <laughs> I I read your work and all I can th- see is, oh, Whitney's proving this point again and again and again and again. And I almost don't want to read any more because it's just so confirming of, of, of a really terrible worldview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know the feeling. I feel that way writing it. <laughs> right, right. I mean, and it's, it's hard to get out of bed sometimes, right? Oh, my God. So I'm not sure where this conversation goes from here, to be honest with you, love. (laughs) Um, So, hey, well, I think where it goes from here is that the solution isn't looking to either of these criminal factions for any sort of solution or rooting for either of them. Uh, The world's either side wants to build are hellish and Orwellian and horrible, and I certainly don't want to live in them. So what this means is that solutions have to be sought out. Uh, by very different avenues than people in the U.S. especially are used to looking for yes. for power. You know, people in the U.S. have been conditioned to look for specifically a single person to be a political savior, yep. right? Who's president? Like, that makes a freaking difference. Like, one man is going to undo all of this mess. Right. Um, I think, you know, people just have to reckon with, with the reality of the situation. No one person can do that. This political savior mentality that has been so ingrained in in u.s political culture it has to stop Mm -hmm. um and we have to start looking to ourselves for the solution that these solutions have to come locally the answer to increased efforts to centralize power you know um uh, the antidote to that is decentralization Right. And that is where all of this has I mean, that's where people have to start. That's what we have to start thinking about. That's where we have to start looking for real solutions um, and as well as ways to sort of divest from this panopticon, which, you mm-hmm. know, at some point, as you pointed out, I mean, people like you and people like me are going to be taken completely off social media. It's very possible that even our individual websites will be pulled up by the roots right. uh, by DNS. I mean, they, they did this to um, the social network Gab. A year or two ago, they just took it out. Yep. Right. These things can happen. Uh, when that happens, um, all of these devices that they use to surveil us, I mean, honestly, for people like me, I mean, they're not really going to benefit me anymore. I may still write. I may not. But um, definitely the 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 point, at, you know, that we have to plan for after that is how, um, you know, how do we build things locally and decentralize things as a way yes. to hedge against these efforts at centralized control? And obviously, you know, they use uh, existing technologies um, against us, right? Of course. So we have to think about how to counter those things. So even though these sort of things um, that we've been talking about today can seem, uh, you know, uh, very bad, which I mean, they are right. But there definitely are ways around it. But people have to um, stop thinking they are powerless, stop willingly giving away their power to these, you know, men in suits who, you know, this outlet tells them that they care about them. And the outlet on the other side says they don't, you know, I mean, Mm -hmm. the power is with us and we have to start taking that back. Right. I no, I agree completely. I'm so glad you said all of that because um, that's exactly what I was hoping you would say. Um, to be honest with you, I'm sitting, I'm sitting back here going, "You said, and we got to take, we got to get back." Like, I'm just gonna shut up. I'm just gonna let that. I'm gonna let that run because that's exactly right. <laughs> um, and I, I no, I love it when a plan comes together. It's like, um, no, absolutely. It, and I've been, I've been 
I've been coaching people this way for years now to say, look, it's not about what Trump can do. One of the things that I think that we're we're learning here, one of the object lessons that's happening that's that that is being impressed upon millions of people right now through this election campaign is that, look, we've had four years of Trump and he's tried in his way, imperfectly gangster like, however you want to put it, to try and change things and try and steer the ship of state in a different direction. Some of it good, some of it bad. We all, you know, we can, we, you know, it's never going to be, you're never going to get everything you want. This is the world we got. This is the world we want. We have the world we got. We have to analyze the world we got and try and find our best way through it. But um, what people are learning is that this process, this thing that we call the uh, America or the West or whatever you want to call, it's too far gone for any one person or any group of people fundamentally change the structures are too uh, embedded and so now it's a matter of you're you're figuring out that it's up to you to decide what's going to happen next certainly go and vote for whoever you think is the better the 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 least bad choice at this point in time um and but at the same time understanding that that's just the the least you can do not the most you can do because at the end of the day it, building your community locally and building your uh, and building your skill set locally and building local ties regardless of political affiliation regardless of whether you think you should be wearing a mask when you go to Walmart or not that's the only thing that's going to get us through and what's truly pernicious and truly evil about what they've done over covid-19 is they've now destroyed local communities now, when you walk I think that store, was part of the plan, too, I though, know. because I think I they knew <laughs> that that was a threat to them and, and what sure. they want to accomplish and what they want to sure. install. Right. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, it, and they also knew that they were going to be activating and mask wearing black block Antifa. And they wanted to be able to embed them everywhere in the society at all moments in time so that when you go to a store, you never know when the person standing next to you pulls out a wrench and whacks you over the head. Like, that's the world we live in now. The good guys don't wear masks. And the bad guys are now uh, are now wearing a scar scarlet letter on their chest. They don't wear a mask. Or they wear a mask that that is, you know, that has Guy Fox on it. And my, my personal favorite, I made an Obey mask, right? I don't know if you've seen it. <laughs> yeah, right? I it's saw just, that. It, right. They live so, in a great movie. <laughs> right. They live. And, you know, for, the, for that, that's where we are. And I think that, you know, it, this is – this – we have to get beyond that. And we and unfortunately, people are so radicalized and they've they've been they've been hurt, they've been they've been gaslit to such a degree. You can't even have a rational conversation with most people about this anymore because everybody's thinking in terms of, oh, my God, I'm going to die from the covid. I'm like your chances of dying from covid unless you're like type one diabetic and, and immunocompromised and over the age of 50 are vanishingly low. It is. It's 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 what's wrong with you that you're that worried about this? And well, that, I mean, it's it's it's, it, it's, it it's conditioning from the media, right? You know, sure. if all the outlets are saying it and all the sure. politicians are saying it and all of these countries are agreeing with it, there's no way it could be inaccurate, right? Well, that's um, part of it. Um, I think. Well, that's how a lot of people rationalize it. I think that buy sure. into it. But I um, think that's the definitely deeper... true outside of the U.S. Like, oh, look, all the countries buy into this. So yeah. there's no way they could all, you know, I, I, be I think, wrong. I think, <laughs> uh, I think you're I think you're right that that's 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 reinforces. I think that reinforces the what's already there psychologically, which is this fundamental fear of what's coming next, that everybody has been living on. We are all living from paycheck to paycheck. We're all living under the sort of Damocles that I could have one medical bill and be bankrupted, or I could have right. one little thing and be bankrupted. My life, my, my comfortable middle-class existence can be taken away from me from a random event on the street. A random encounter on the street could literally ruin my entire family's life. And when you have people at, living at that level of anxiety all the time, how hard is it to push them to the point of insanity over something that honestly is has a lethality rate that's less than the average flu. And that's that dude, I, I'll give them credit. Their psychological profiling of us is spot on. Because, they, well, I mean, they, since, they since the days of Edward Bernays, they have poured 
millions upon millions of dollars into studying psychology of the masses, right? Mm -hmm. And how to herd people exactly into the, the, I don't know, ideological corrals, I guess, that they want the majority of people to be in, how to play each side off of each other, how to manipulate everything to their benefit. Um, You know, this is a science that they have cultivated and developed for over a century now. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, we're just seeing, unfortunately, like the end game of it. Um, I really think, though, that it's going to get um, much worse before it gets better, particularly the closer we get to um, the date set for the election. And -hmm. obviously what comes in the immediate aftermath um, of November 3rd. Right. So um, I think, you know. Despite the fact that this whole COVID thing has really forced apart um, people, created distance between people and local communities, um, efforts have to be, people have to make, uh, redouble their efforts to rebuild that and build upon that to the greatest extent possible or we are screwed. I agree. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll say one more thing. I'm looking at a much longer time frame than just November. I think that this is going to take, the, the cultural evolution in China took 10 years to burn out before Mao finally put it, uh, put it in its place. I think we're looking at the same sort of thing here in the United States. Uh, I think it's going to be a decade's worth of social unrest, social upheaval, possibly even, you know, a breakup, secession, all of that. Um, And um, we're going to be looking at the same kind of cultural breakdown that they saw in Russia post-Soviet Union breakdown. Uh, These things take 10 years for the cycle to turn. And they take, you know, fourth turnings in Strauss and Howe terms, they take 20 years to play themselves. They take an entire generation to play out. And it's uh, it, it, it and I can and I'll tell you what I'm the most encouraging thing. I'll, one of the things I've noticed having like do, dove back in in the last few months into gun culture. I mean, I've always been a gun, I've always been a gun guy, or at least as an adult, I've always been a gun guy. But, you know, for the last 10 years or so, I haven't bought any guns or gone shooting or anything else. But what I've noticed is the following. Ready? With the advent of the possibility of, of a Democrat taking the White House, people aren't buying the guns they think are going to be banned. When Biden takes office, they're buying the guns they think they're going to need to defend themselves and their family. If you look at go to all the major gun sites, gun broker, cheaper than dirt, guns.com, whatever, it doesn't matter. Go to Bud's Guns, whatever. You'll see what's out of stock. Gun shop. Talk to them about what they're selling. Everybody's buying self-defense weapons. Everybody's buying snub nose 38s, small carry nine millimeters if you the only thing if you if you want an 1873 you know uh colt six shooter single action six shooter no problem there's a replica out there with your name on it in some variety you want something that you can you can defend yourself with no you want something for home defense you want a, you want a shotgun good luck good luck trying to find a you know mossberg 590 shockwave or something like that i mean i can like a this is what i'm seeing and that's a fundamental difference from every other moment in hmm. the last 30 years People are rightfully scared about their future. Their time horizons have sh- have shrunk. Their time preference to, like, invoke a libertarian term, uh, Austrian economics. Their time preference is now next week. It's not a year from now. Right. And under those con- under those psychological conditions, you can get people to do almost anything. But it's also saying. Uh, What's they're not going to be successful at trying to destroy the United States. The, the election is, I agree with you, it's completely irrelevant. It's it's going to be the most important election of all time and the most irrelevant. Because I, it's yeah, all, absolutely. Because well the, said. Yeah, because at some point both of these, because everything we just described, no matter who wins, the outcome winds up being the same, just with different, just you know, the the final point at the end winds up being the same, no matter what path we take to get there. Um, so, you know, it's very interesting what I'm what I'm seeing happen, what else you're seeing. I know you're not here in the U.S. and not in the middle of it. So um, good for you. <laughs> yeah, but Honestly. I mean, a lot of these, uh, you know, control systems they're setting up. I mean, they're trying to make that an, an everywhere thing. Sure. Right. Of um, so it's definitely something to be uh, mindful of. I mean, there are places you know, outside the U.S. that don't have what's going on in the U- U.S. right now as a part of, you know, uh, what's increasingly becoming a part of daily existence there, right? But I mean, mm-hmm. to assume that there's any country that's going to be spared uh, from this entirely, I think is naive. Um, mm-hmm. So those, you know, efforts to prepare or whatever um, are the same. But if someone 
uh, wants to leave the U.S., for example, um, you know, it would make sense to do that soon. If you mm-hmm. if you feel like, you know, your local community, um, you're not able to build those sort of ties there, then maybe, you know, a person should consider looking elsewhere. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but honestly, you know, this is this is a global crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, it's definitely, you know, a, a lot of global crises in the past have sort of spared the U.S. to an extent. Right. Or at sure. least large pockets of, of places within the U.S. Um, and that's not really how it is anymore. So for the first time in a long time, you know, uh, a crisis of that scale is definitely brewing and is set to, you know, explode at some point um, yeah. in the U.S. And unfortunately, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people in the U.S. that are not prepared for any sort of eventuality um, like that or the ability to support themselves and their families um, you know, in a local sense, um, a lot of people in the U.S. don't have any idea about self-defense, how to provide for themselves um, and things like that. So, you know, um, it's definitely, um, you know, concerning in that sense. But this is definitely a global thing. Right. So, you know, even though I'm not in the thick of what's going on in the U.S., I mean, there are uh, similar issues going on in, I would argue, most countries in the world right now. I, I would I, I would agree with you completely. I'm since we're the epicenter of this, everything that happens here is going to reverberate around the world. Oh, sure. And uh, and, you know, the fallout from capital markets and, 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 and commodity markets and everything else. It's going to be a, a very interesting decade. And uh, I don't think it's going to get uh, I don't think it gets less interesting from here. It only gets it only accelerates. And I just, you know, yes, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. And and it's going to be even that much more stressful for all of us. And uh, well, I, I it's right. Crazy. I, well, I think something we have to accept, too, is that what was there before is not going to be there again. No. no. Right? There yes. is a, an effort to collapse everything, society, the economy, whatever. The question is, who do we let rebuild it? Do we let these crazy criminal factions vying for control of it, you know, do we yep. let them rebuild, right? Mm-hmm. Or do, you know, regular people build something? Right. Because they've, no, cause they've, cause, you know, what they've done is they've declared war on normal people. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they've just they've literally declared war on normal people and saying that you're evil and that you breathe and that makes you a bad person. Yeah, um, the, the the free breathers. That's what it's going to be. Yeah, next. the free breathers. It's crazy. And, 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 that's, and that's just <laughs> so, you know, you wanting to be able to breathe freely as a uh, as an example of your white privilege. Well, OK, <sighs> there you go. And then you just blow it in their face. I'm like, hold on, let me get a cigar and let me blow that in your face. Um, because that's, you know, I'm prickly that way. Um, Whitney, this has been a, an absolute <laughs> and utter, an, an utter blast. And I've enjoyed every, every minute of it. And I can talk to you for hours. Long. So, um, but I'm going to think, I think it would be best to cut it off here and uh, let us both get back to our incredibly busy schedules of what we need to get done so that we can continue to chronicle the destruction, the socio and economic and political destruction of the human race. <laughs> That's what we do. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I normally don't think of it in those terms, but I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I guess so. That's what I do. That's exactly. I, I just curate the, I just curate the suck is kind of the way I've, got, I've gotten to the point of putting it. <laughs> yeah, I like that. All right, so yeah. I'm gonna let you get back to it, and uh, if there's anything you want to say on your way out the door to to the people that uh, will listen to this, uh, it, it, the four is yours. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, just um, people that are interested in following my work, you can check for my stuff on thelastamericanvagabond.com, unlimitedhangout.com. You can follow me on Twitter why I am still around, uh, underscore Whitney Webb. Um, you can support me on Patreon, Whitney Webb MPN um, is, is my Patreon uh, username. So you can find uh, all my stuff through there. Um, all my articles, um, well, except for the one I had out uh, yesterday just because of the timeliness of the, um, of the topic. But more often than not, a lot of my reports are available to patrons first for several days and then become publicly available. Fair enough. Thank you, love, and for uh, all that you do uh, and everything Thank else. You. You're an absolute. <laughs> Likewise. You're an, you're an absolute. Uh, uh, you're an absolute asset to the community and to all of us, and uh, uh, just a credit to, to you. So <laughs> I appreciate Thanks. your time, your your time, and everything else. And I will speak to you again soon. We must do this again. So. All right. Uh, wonderful. Thank you, Tom. Take care, Whitney. We'll see you soon. All right. Bye bye. Well, that about does it for episode 43 of the Gold Ghosts and Guns podcast. Uh, Hope you all tune in next week. I've got somebody else on the line to talk about some 
go a little bit off board. I'm hoping to get that interview together. If not, I will figure out something else to talk about because, well, there's never a shortage of things to talk about in this world today. You can follow my work over at TomLuongo.me. You can follow me on Twitter at TFL1728. Live streams, they happen every Monday night at 8 p.m. and every Friday night at 8.30. Warning, I'm a bad boy with a potty mouth, and I use those words and sentences. You guys take care. We'll talk soon. Keep your stick on the ice.